Hi, everybody. So I have a new toy that I'm playing with now. Uh, I got a free membership to Zoom, and I'm going to use it to record the videos that we're going to use for showing you how to do the questions from test number three. Up on my desk there, you'll see there's Elmo. Elmo's not feeling too well, and his friends are all around trying to help him feel better. So let's get started. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's take a look at question one. So question one tells us to show the mechanism for the Clayson condensation of ethyl acetate and to construct a, re construct a reaction coordinate diagram that corresponds to your mechanism. Be sure to label all features in your diagram. Do not include the acid quench in your diagram, but do show it in the reaction. What drives this reaction to completion before the acid quench? So that's quite a lot to unpack. Uh, this was a take home exam. So this actually was not meant to be a hard question. And for the most part, people got the mechanism. The mechanism is in the notes. Uh, we'll go there. Here's the mechanism. So we can see we start off with uh, an ester that has hydrogens on the alpha carbon, and we use a base. We typically use the base that corresponds to what the alcohol portion of the ester would be. So we take ethoxide, we pull off one of those alpha protons, and we make this uh, enolate type anion. The enolate anion, this is just showing a resonance structure. Remember, these are the same structure. They're not different, they're just re different representations of the same structure. So the enolate ion can attack another molecule of the ester. And here we're seeing it, they're showing it, are pushing our arrows, and we're attacking the carbonyl carbon. We're forming a bond between this carbon and the carbonyl carbon, and the electrons end up on the oxygen, just like this, we get our tetrahedral intermediate. Now the tetrahedral intermediate can go back, as it can always go back, but it can go forward by, instead of uh, kicking off the elate anion, it can kick off an alkoxide when it reforms that carbon-oxygen double bond. When we do that, we actually get this thing looks like our product. In fact, that will be our final product. There's one problem. It has a pKa. This hydrogen is very acidic because it's now in between two carbonyl groups. It's much more acidic than the hydrogen on an ethanol molecule. So this ethoxide base is just gonna rip that off and form this enolate anion, which is quite stabilized because that negative charge can be delocalized all the way over to the negative oxygen. We could also draw a resonance structure with it on the carbon. So that's our mechanism. Oh yes, we have to complete it. We would just throw a whole bunch of uh, something like hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, any strong acid. We would just throw enough in there so that we protonate all of these and we in fact get this back. This would be our final product, but we have to throw a bunch of acid in to get it there because this reaction is so exothermic because of the difference in pKa between these two uh, compounds, between this ethanol, pKa is 15 or 16, the pKa here is 11, so the ethoxide is gonna rip that off and form it. So the next part of our question was to construct a reaction coordinate diagram. And here I have our reaction coordinate diagram axes. Uh, we have energy. This is some form of energy. Uh, typically it's enthalpy. It might be free energy. Uh, it could be uh, some other kind of energy. But for chemists, it's typically enthalpy or free energy. And I'm going to do it in terms of enthalpy. But we've just labeled it energy and that's fine. Uh, the other axis is just our reaction coordinate. That's to show the progress of the reaction. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna grab hold of this and I'm gonna bring it over here because I wanna be able to refer to it. And I'm just gonna make it smaller uh, for now. Make it small enough so that maybe we can still see from it. But when we construct our reaction coordinate, we have to start off and here I have different things that I'm gonna use to uh, 
construct my reaction coordinate, I have to put start somewhere. So this is my reactance. This is where I start the reaction. And the next step in my reaction is going to be the formation of the very first intermediate. So I need to put a space out for that. There's my next intermediate. And then I have to form my next intermediate. It's not this one, but it's this one. I need one of these little resting places for every intermediate. And I have one, two, three intermediates, and a final product. Barring the, the, the actual final product, which comes after the acid quench, but the final part product for the first part of the reaction. So I need one, two, three, four, five of these resting spots. So I'm just gonna put those here. There we go, I have five. And I'm gonna use up my whole reaction coordinate diagram. Well, maybe not because... So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna take these five and I'm gonna make them all, I'm gonna use a... I'm gonna align or distribute them. I'm gonna align them all so that they're all at the same energy to start with. That's just to start. We have to fix those energies after. Uh, Oops, we have to hit undo. There we go. I want to align them all middles. There we go. They're all the same energy now. And I also want to distribute them so that they're more or less uh, distributed horizontally. There we go. So now I'm going to adjust the energies of these different intermediates. That's our starting material. I typically, if I have some indication of the reaction is exothermic or endothermic, I may adjust where that is, but I want to leave enough room so that I can have higher energy intermediates. Intermediates are typically almost always higher in energy than both reactants and products. So these three intermediates have to be higher in energy than the reactants and the products. Take a look at these intermediates and let's just see uh, approximately how much higher in energy. Now this first one, this actually helps us out a lot because the pKa for ethanol is 15 or 16 and the pKa for that hydrogen on the ester is 22. So this reaction is very much going to favor the reactants, uh, and this must be much higher in energy. So we're going to make that higher in energy. I'm just going to move that up. I'm going to move it up to about there. That'll leave me room uh, to have an activation barrier. Let's take a look now at the next one. And where's the next one relative to this one? So we go from this enolate to something that looks a lot like an alkoxide. So this is an alkoxide. It has an oxygen bonded to the same carbon. Uh, so it's gonna be higher in energy than this alkoxide, which is ethoxide, but it's gonna be lower in energy than this enolate. So I'm gonna move that accordingly. It's gonna be higher than my starting materials, but lower than that enolate. My next reaction goes from this thing, which is like an alkoxide, to this. This actually is gonna be very similar in energy to my starting materials. Uh, it might be a little bit lower in energy, might be a little bit higher in energy. Uh, it's actually a tiny little bit lower in energy, most likely, so I'm gonna put it down. It's not a lot. So I'm just gonna make it a little lower in energy than my starting material. Now finally, it's this last reaction that drives the reaction. The pKa difference is uh, not as large as this pKa difference, but it's pretty large. Uh, difference of 15 or 16 and 11. The pKa for this is 11. So I'm gonna make this final one down. 
And I'm going to exaggerate it because I want to talk about it being the reaction that drives this reaction. So what drives this reaction is the fact that this final product is lower in energy than the starting materials. Uh, and of course, any of these things that are intermediates. This is an unusual case where this is an intermediate, but it's actually a little bit lower in energy than the starting materials. But that's fine because it's still quite a bit higher in energy than the final product. Now all we have to do, remember each one of these corresponds to those set of conditions and we'll talk about that in a second. So now I just want to hook them up and I have some tools here. I'm going to bring all of these over. These are my bumps. They're not really pretty, uh, but they'll be fine. So my first reaction is endothermic and I have a little thing there that's endothermic and it may or may not fit doesn't quite fit. Uh, I can fix that, oops, by clicking on this edit points and I just need to bring that up. Pretty close to being good. So I'm gonna just make this a little rough. I'm not gonna worry too, too much about it. So the first step in the reaction has to go over an energy barrier and there we get our next one. So our next one, uh, this one looks like it might be pretty good. As you might guess, I did do a little bit of pre-work here. Doesn't quite fit. I'm gonna edit the points. I'm gonna bring this down. There we go. And I'm actually gonna bring this down a little bit too because the activation barrier, uh, remember, let's take a look at what we're doing. Our reaction is, uh, this was our first one was this intermediate. Remember, these are the same thing. They're just different representations of the very same molecule, which is an enolate anion. Then we form this ethoxide, okay? So uh, we formed a carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, there's not gonna be a tremendous barrier to this, but a little bit of a barrier. So maybe I will uh, just lift that a little bit. There we go, oops. At the points. There we go. And this one I'm going to. I'm going to bring this down just to try and make it look a little curvy. That's not too bad. It's not horrible. I'm going to shorten it up. There we go. Just a little bit. So now. We go from that alkoxide, we're gonna reform a carbon oxygen double bond and kick off an ethoxide. Uh, so I'm not gonna have a large barrier for the next step of the reaction. It's gonna be a small barrier. I'm just going to uh, edit the points. So, a small barrier, I'm gonna make it a small barrier. There we go, that's the next step. And then uh, the next reaction is uh, even more exothermic. So I'm just gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna edit the points. This all the way down, and this one down, so it looks kind of like an energy diagram. It's not terrific, but it's not horrible either. It does get the point across, so let's make this big enough so that maybe we can see it a little bit. We'll go through this one last time. So our starting material is these two molecules, and they're at some energy level. That's this energy level. Our first step in the reaction is the removal of a proton, so our ethoxide removes a proton and becomes ethanol. That should actually be over here. Uh, and the enolate anion. And this is the energy level for that ethanol molecule in the enolate anion, okay? Now, again, that's not a reaction, that's a resonance structure. When we form our carbon-carbon bond, we go over an energy barrier and we get to here, we form that carbon-carbon bond. Now, 
This is entirely this intermediate, which is like an alkoxide. Uh, it, it is an alkoxide and there's a leaving group next to it. So we can reform our double bond uh, and we end up, uh, I'm sorry, where did I go? No, yeah, so I'm sorry. We went from here, we reformed our double bond. That's right, and we get to our uh, alpha, our beta keto ester product is here, and the ethoxide anion. And this final reaction is pulling off that proton to get to here. And there we go. That's how we construct the energy diagram. Uh, I must admit, I thought I was making this a gift and you, many people had problems making their energy diagram. They didn't have the right number of hills and valleys. There's a simple way to do that. You need as many hills as you have reaction arrows, not counting resonance arrows. So we have one, two, three, four. We need four hills. One, two, three, four. We need as many valleys as we have intermediates, and we have one, one intermediate, two intermediates, three intermediates, one, two, three. And we need reactants and we need products. There we go. I hope that helps you the next time you have to build a reaction coordinate diagram. Don't forget to count your intermediates and you need one of those valleys for every intermediate along with a reactant and a product molecule. Another way to think about it is to count those reaction arrows and know that you need a hill for every reaction arrow. So thank you.